Greetings to all those present. My name is Ankit Malhotra. I am the co-founder and president of the Jindal Society of International Law. I welcome everyone for our discussion on a very interesting topic with an extremely interesting speaker. I acknowledge the presence of our dear friend, the society's dear friend and dean of the Government of Public Policy School, Dean Professor Darshan. Before I introduce our speaker and the topic, let me speak a few words about the Center for Human Studies under which the society is created. The Center for Human Studies aims to develop a learning platform on opportunities and limits of the UN by enhancing research and building knowledge on how the United Nations systems work, both in terms of institutional development and in terms of promotion and implementation of various multilateral policies. My discussions with Professor Kuparski over the years, he has often reminded me of the conversation which took place in 1953. This is when the first UN Secretary General Trigo Bli welcomed his successor, Dag Hamschkold, who, who, who was welcomed with the following remark, and I quote, welcome Dag to the most impossible job on this earth, end quote. The UN, which has often been criticized and turned into a scapegoat, and other states have failed to live up to the initial expectations of its founders. To this, Professor Kowalski is often reminding me that Armstrong famously replied that the United Nations was not created to take us to heaven, but to save us from hell. The Center for Human Studies engages in projects studying the history and traditions of the United Nations, it takes a transformative approach to research, teaching, and societal engagement, having in mind the latest dynamic geopolitical and technological shifts. Then the Society for International Law is a student-led initiative under the aegis of the Center for Human Studies. Both of these organizations are spearheaded by Professor Dr. Weston Kowalski. The Society was founded in, in the November of 2020 and was inaugurated by the Herbert and Rose Ruben Professor of International Law, Professor Jose Enrique Alvarez of New York University, our respected Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. West, Professor Dr. C. Rajkumar, the Faculty Coordinator, Professor Dr. West Kowalski, and another dear friend of the Society, Professor Dr. Mohan Kumar. Our four lecture series of 2021, exploring the ecosystem of international law, builds upon the introduction given on internationalism and international law by the concluded spring lecture series titled Future of Internationalism and International Law. The four lecture series endeavors to study the different contours of international law. To assist in the study, the speakers will cover and address the respective areas of expertise based on the years of research and practice. The vast ecosystem and the engagement of international law in it the society aims to study the fragmentation and fertilization of the various disciplines in their ecosystem. The lowest common denominator in the four lecture series is to enhance and provide a deeper understanding of international law through international lawyers. The society for its members is a well of knowledge and a quorum of thought-provoking discussions it should be the resultant of this engagement with experts aimed at exploring the ecosystem of international law. Before I introduce our speaker, let me lay down the foundation for which he will interact, engage, and perhaps also even encounter. This is an account that Winston Churchill delivered at Misery in 1946 after the war. And he discusses the interaction and engagement of the United States with international organizations and also the United Kingdom. He said, and I quote him, we, this is the United Kingdom, must make sure that the work it does is fruitful and the reality of, and over here he speaks of the organizations, is not a sham, that it is a force for action and not merely a fronting of the words. That is a true temple of peace in which the shields of many nations can someday be hung up and not merely a cockpit in the Tower of Babylon. 
Churchill speaks about the international organizations and specifically the United Nations further. He says, and I quote him again, courts and magistrates must be set up, but they cannot function without sheriffs and constables. The United Nations organization must immediately begin to be equipped with an international armed force. He stresses and actually lays down how this can be done as well. But the concept which he furthers is that it would not be criminal madness to cast it adrift in this still agitated and ununited world. With this, let me introduce our speaker, who is Professor Niles Bloker. Professor Niles Bloker was appointed at Leiden University as a professor of international institutional law in 2013. And since 2013, he has full appointment of this role. He graduated from Leiden University, but he also defended his dissertation in 1989. And from 1984, he uh, was a lecturer, subsequently senior lecturer in the law of international organizations at Leiden University. And in 2000, he was appointed as senior legal counsel at the Netherlands Foreign Affairs Ministry. And in 2007, he became deputy legal advisor at this ministry. As of 1st of August 2013, he left his role in the ministry and worked as a full-time professor at Leiden. His publications include International Regulation of World Trade in Textiles. This was part of his dissertation. He was also authored in International Institutional Law and Proliferation of International Organizations. He has also worked on the Security Council and the Use of Force which co-authored with Nico Schreiber in 2005. He also wrote the elected members of the Security Council, which again co-edited with Nico Schreiber. He also written Saving Succeeding Generations from the Source of War, the UN Security Council at 75, which is his latest project. He is also co-founded and co-edited in chief of the Journal of International Organizations Law Review. His main cut and current research projects is about the governance of international courts and tribunals. Of this and their governance, and also of tribunals, Professor Bloker will be speaking about today. Professor Bloker, I now invite you and request you to please commence with your address. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction. Uh, dear colleagues from Jindal Global Law School, from its Center for the Study of United Nations and from the Jindal Society of International Law. Dear Professor Popovsky, dear Professor Sudarshan, dear Arudra Ravindra, dear Ankit Malotra, I thank you and others involved for inviting me to give this guest lecture. It is a great initiative by your society to organize these guest lectures and an honor to follow in the footsteps of colleagues who have spoken on earlier occasions. India has become active in the field of international law in recent years. At Leiden University in the Netherlands, where I live and teach, um, we have welcomed during the last decade an increasing number of students from India to do our Master in Public International Law or our Advanced LLM program in Public International Law. Our 50 advanced LLM students in public international law this academic year come from 23 different countries from all over the world, but India is best represented with nine students. I remember well the Indian students whose thesis I supervised, and I'm currently supervising one PhD student from India. It is clear that the young generation in India takes a keen interest in international law and is strongly motivated to study it. Dear audience, those of you who are listening in India and perhaps also in other countries, it is a privilege and a pleasure for me to give this guest lecture for you. When asked about the topic on which I would like to speak, I first thought I should speak on the Security Council and international law. I know that there is a lot of interest in India and the Security Council. India is a great contributor to UN peacekeeping operations, and India has since long trying to become a permanent member of the Council. Having some 18% of the world population, this seems to be an obvious desire. 
with India as a permanent member, the Security Council would be more representative and more legitimate. This is important since the Security Council should play a key role in the maintenance of international peace and security with its enforcement powers. This is essential in the pursuit of justice. La justice sans la force est impuissante, as the French philosopher Blaise Pascal wrote in the 17th century. Justice without might is powerless. However, Pascal continued as follows. La force sans la justice est tyrannique. And this means in English, might without justice is tyrannical. Therefore, I decided to choose another topic for this lecture, a topic that may be less well known in India than that of the Security Council, and that is related to justice. I would like to speak about international courts and tribunals. International courts are familiar to India and to its international lawyers. India is a party to the statute of the International Court of Justice that is an integral part of the UN Charter. Moreover, India is one of the 74 countries that have recognized the jurisdiction of the ICJ as compulsory. As a party to the UN Law of the Sea Convention, India is also a party to the statute of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. As a member of the World Trade Organization, India is subject to the jurisdiction of the WTO appellate body, although that body is currently unable to perform its functions. India has or has had judges in each of these three international courts and tribunals. <clears throat> However, today I do not want to focus on the position and the role of international courts and tribunals such as these three. I would like to discuss the way in which they are run, the governance of international courts and tribunals. And this is why I have chosen as the title of my presentation the following four words in Latin, quis custodiet ipsos custodet. In English, this more or less means who will guard the guardians themselves. The guardians refers to international courts and tribunals. They are the guardians of our international legal order, both at the global and at the regional level, interpreting and applying international law, settling disputes peacefully, punishing perpetrators of the most serious international crimes, giving advisory opinions, in short, providing justice. The question I would like to discuss is who will guard these guardians? Who is taking care of the governance of these international courts and tribunals? I have chosen this topic because with others, I'm carrying out a research project in this field. Two years ago, I've organized with colleagues a large international conference about this topic at Leiden University. And we are now preparing a book on the basis of the contributions to this conference. In my presentation, I would like to discuss four issues. First, I will explain the relevance, the importance of this topic, the governance of international courts and tribunals. Secondly, I will give an overview, an inventory of the existing governance institutions of international courts and tribunals. Third, I will propose a typology of the existing governance institutions. Finally, I will briefly discuss the two main governance principles that guide the work of these institutions, the principles of independence and accountability. So first of all, I will explain the relevance, the importance of this topic. We need to pay much more attention to the governance of international courts and tribunals in practice and in academia for three reasons. The topic is under-researched, it is urgent, and it concerns structural problems. Let me explain these three reasons. First, the topic is under-researched. There has been a fast and impressive growth in the number of international courts and tribunals over the last three decades. From six in 1990 to some 30, 30 now. This includes many regional courts and tribunals that exist now in all parts of the world except Asia. Examples are the Andean Court and the Caribbean Court of Justice in Latin America, the Court of the East African Community, and a number of European courts, in particular the EU Court and the European Court of Human Rights. As I mentioned, there are now some 30, 30 of these international courts and tribunals. Even more, 
um, even more, there are 50 if we also include international administrative tribunals. And these are specific uh, tribunals created to settle disputes between international organizations and their staff. The role and functioning of all these international courts and tribunals affect international law and international relations, as has been analyzed in many books, articles, and in recent years also in blogs, podcasts, etc. And I remember an, a student from India coming to me a few years ago whether he would, whether I would be willing to have an interview with him, um, uh, and I, it was a great pleasure to do that. The research focus has been very much on the courts and tribunals themselves, analyzing their functioning, their judgments. And this is excellent and necessary, and it should continue. However, within the field of international law, hardly any attention has been given to the governance of international courts and tribunals. So the topic is under research. Secondly, the topic is also urgent. Many international courts and tribunals are facing difficult questions and strong criticism relating to their governance. I only need to mention the International Criminal Court and the World Trade Organization appellate body in this context. The tribunal of the Southern African Development Community was even effectively closed by the 15 states involved after it delivered a judgment that the Mugabe government of Zimbabwe did not like. If we care about international law, we care about how it is applied by international courts and tribunals, and therefore we should care about their functioning. We need to take the criticism seriously and address it. Well-performing international courts and tribunals are good for international law and for the international legal order. The third reason why we should discuss the governance of international courts and tribunals is that the topic concerns structural problems. The attacks against the ICC and the World Trade Organization appellate body and the criticism of the way in which they are run are no exception. Regional human rights courts are facing resistance and obstruction. Some states are leaving international courts and tribunals or consider doing so. These attacks and criticism are not limited to a few specific courts and tribunals only. They are, seems, there seem to be more fundamental underlying developments which outgrow the specificities of each international court, tribunal, and their governance. Now, my intention is certainly not to engage in all kinds of conspiracy theories, but on the other hand, we should not be naive. There is little reason to believe that these tax and attacks and criticism are isolated and temporary and will automatically evaporate. The courts themselves and the states involved must deal with these questions and criticism in an adequate way. One observation that I would like to make in this context is that it should not be forgotten that the creation and functioning of all these international courts and tribunals is a relatively novel phenomenon. It needs time to pay off and meet the expectations. Rome has not been built in a day. Often the swing of the pendulum goes from high ups at the beginnings to downs not too many years later. It takes time before international courts and tribunals have established themselves and have been fully accepted. It takes time before they occupy a stable place in the international order that has long been institutionally weak, almost exclusively state dominated. Governance of international courts and tribunals is in short about the way in which they are run. This is done partly by the courts and tribunals themselves. Perhaps we can call this internal governance or judicial self-governance. It is for the courts themselves to take all kinds of decisions regarding the judicial proceedings, how the work of the court is organized, cases distributed, etc. However, many other governance decisions are not taken by the courts and tribunals themselves, but by outside bodies. Perhaps we can call this external governance. Examples of such decisions are the election of judges, the adoption of budgets, and the supervision over the implementation of judgments. The distinction between internal and external governance is delicate. Many of the decisions that courts take have financial implications. Do states just have to pay whatever the courts say they need to perform their functions? <laughs> 
many of the decisions taken by governance institutions have implications for the way in which courts and tribunals can perform their functions. If these institutions elect judges who are not fit for the job or do not adopt an adequate budget, this will affect the work of the courts. Now, these are delicate issues because courts and tribunals must be both independent and accountable. This is fully recognized at a high level of principles. However, when we go down to more specific questions in practice, it is more, it is more difficult to determine or to, to agree what is purely for the courts to decide without outside interference and what is properly subject to external governance. This is important also because it is related to accountability. It is clear that courts must be accountable for their own internal governance. It is less clear in our state dominated world how and towards whom those responsible for external governance are accountable. At the national level, we have been familiar with such questions for a long time. These are often much more debated, perhaps also in India. This may provide some consolation or relativization. It will remind us that the governance issues we are discussing are far from unique for international courts and tribunals only. They are inherent in the governance of all courts, both at the national and the international level. At the international level, these questions are relatively new Obviously, there is experience with the governance of the few international courts that already exist since long, but these questions have now become urgent. The current criticism of international courts and tribunals is difficult to isolate from the current climate of rising nationalism, populism and anti-multilateralism. The zeitgeist now is different from the one prevailing in the 1990s. This week, during the general debate of the UN General Assembly, we hear many statements that refer to this climate in one way or another, either criticizing or supporting multilateralism, international cooperation, and the work of international organizations. The statement by President Biden of the US last Tuesday has been rather supportive of international cooperation. But only a few years before, President Donald Trump referred to the International Criminal Court as a court that, and I quote him now, has no jurisdiction, no legitimacy, and no authority. And as an unelected, unaccountable global bureaucracy, unquote. International courts and tribunals obviously belong to the supranational structures to which states have submitted themselves but which are now increasingly criticized. The governance of international courts and tribunals may of course also be researched from the perspectives of other disciplines, in particular political science and international relations. But there is certainly also a need for research by international lawyers. International courts and tribunals are created by international law, they apply international law and their decisions affect international law. In researching the governance of international courts and tribunals, two legal perspectives may be distinguished, an institutional and a substantive law perspective. From an institutional perspective, what is needed is much more research into the role and functioning of the governance institutions of international courts and tribunals. Earlier, I have coined these bodies in Jugo Vince, International Judicial Governance Institutions, in Jugo Vince. These are the organs that elect the judges, adopt the budgets and take other governance decisions. Each international court and tribunal has its own in Jukovin, its own in, um, international judicial governance institution. An example is the ICC Assembly of State Parties. The proper role and functioning of these in Jugovins is essential for the successful performance of the functions of international courts and tribunals. It is a fundamental institutional fact that these bodies are not just individual states sitting together, but organs, collective bodies that operate on the basis of predetermined rules and powers and have their own practice. From a substantive law perspective, what is needed is more research into certain good governance, rules and principles that serve to guarantee the independence of international courts and tribunals and provide for an accountability framework. 
at the international at the national level, such rules and principles usually exist, and their observance is supervised by international bodies such as the IMF, the European Union, and the Venice Commission of the Council of Europe. At the international level, much of this is lacking, although some pioneering work has already been done. For example, the 2004 Burghaus principles on the independence of the international judiciary. Taken together, we could perhaps conceive of these two perspectives, the institutional and the substantive law perspective, as an emerging constitutional law of international courts and tribunals. Obviously, each international court and tribunal has its own constitutional law, but at the same time, these specific constitutional laws have much in common. There is unity within diversity. Following the introduction of this topic and uh, emphasizing the relevance, the importance of the topic, I will now, in the second part of my presentation, give an overview of the existing governance institutions um, of um, international courts and tribunals. It would take too much time to mention the Andukovids of all existing international courts and tribunals. Let me therefore take the three main governance functions of Andukovids, the election of judges, the adoption of the budget, and the enforcement of sentences, and give some examples of the governance institutions that are responsible for carrying out these functions. First, the election of judges. Judges of the ICJ are elected by the UN General Assembly and the Security Council. Judges of the Law of the Sea Tribunal are elected by the Meeting of States Parties to the UN Law of the Sea Convention. Members of the WTO Appellate Body are elected by the WTO Dispute Settlement Body. Now, if we look at all existing international courts and tribunals, the following conclusions can be drawn. The election of judges is a core function of injugo wins. International courts and tribunals cannot settle disputes and deliver justice as defined in their statutes or other constituent instruments without well-qualified judges. While this is also true for national courts, it is even more true at the international level where sovereign and sometimes very powerful states rule and where courts are not embedded in a strong legal order. In such a context where the rule of power may be stronger than the rule of law, judges of high authority and reputation are needed even more than at the national level. This high standard is reflected in the legal provisions encapsulating the qualifications for these positions. Two stages must be distinguished in the process of electing international judges, the nomination of candidates and the final election. Each international court and tribunal has its own specific rules governing for, uh, governing for those two stages, governing those two stages. While these rules are, have some, share some common characteristics, there are also considerable differences. Some of these differences may be explained by the fact that the number of courts have judges from each of the participating states, while others have judges from only a limited number of state parties. In the first case, there is an obligation to elect judges from each participating state. If courts have judges from only some state parties, candidates often need to campaign and the Andukovins involved must make a choice between nominees from different states' parties, as happened when in 2017, Judge Badari from India and Judge Greenwood from the United Kingdom were candidates to be re-elected as IGJ judges. It is noteworthy that not all sub-regional courts or regional courts are co composed of judges from all member states. Examples are the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, the ECOWAS Court in Africa, and the Caribbean Court of Justice. In the two stages of nomination and election, the governments of the relevant states often play a dominant role, especially during the final election. However, Already in 1920, more than, uh, more than 100 years ago, when the Permanent Court of International Justice was created, the awareness existed already that it was in the common interest of participating states that nominations should be made at some distance from governments by the national groups of the Permanent Court of Arbitration. The nomination task was therefore given to experts who were deemed more qualified to assess the extent to which candidates met the requirements mentioned in the statute. The final choice was still 
to be made by organs composed of government representatives. But at least there were some guarantees that this choice concerned qualified candidates and not, to put it bluntly, less independent friends of the government, whether qualified or less qualified. At present, there is considerable variation in the way candidates are nominated. The nomination procedure involving the national groups of the Permanent Court of Arbitration is currently not only used for the ICJ, but is also one of the two nomination procedures for ICC judges. For other international courts, nominations are in most cases made by the governments of the relevant states. Often they must or may present more than one candidate, which gives the advantage of choice to the electing organ. In recent years, the nomination of candidate judges for some international courts has become less the exclusive or near exclusive prerogative of the governments concerned due to the increased screening by external bodies. Once nominations have been made, final election decisions must be taken. It is often observed that judges of international courts and tribunals are generally elected by organs composed of representatives of the governments of the participating states. However, there is room for nuance here. In some cases, international judges are elected in fundamentally different ways, as follows. By a parliamentary organ, for example, the European Court of Human Rights, judges are elected by the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, not by an organ composed of representatives of governments. By the UN Secretary General, and the government of the state concerned. This happens in the case, happened in the case of the uh, Special Court for Sierra Leone, uh, the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. By a commission of experts, the Judicial and Legal Services Commission. This happens in the case of two international Caribbean courts. By the Supreme Courts of the participating states. This happens in the case of the Central American Court of Justice or in the same way as the election of judges of the higher economic and commercial courts, the state's concern. This happens in the case of the Commonwealth of Independent States Court. Therefore, the election of international judges is no longer the exclusive domain of bodies composed of representatives of governments. Also, in at least one case where international judges are elected by such a body, the European Union, expert advice is given on the candidates before election decisions are made. The so-called 255 panel gives its opinion on candidates' suitability to perform the duties of judge and advocate general of the Court of Justice and the General Court before the governments of the member states make the appointments. Between March 2010 and October 2019, more than 20% of the first term opinions of the panel were unfavorable. Even though the panel opinions are not binding, they have always been followed even in the cases in which they were unfavorable. Thus, it is not entirely left to politics, the governments of the EU member states, when it comes to making the necessary election decisions. Now, let me look, now look at the um, second governance function of Njugovic, the adoption of the budget. This is another core function of, for Njugovic. It is obvious that international courts and tribunals require an adequate, adequate budget that enables them to perform their functions. At the same time, it is also obvious that the views of international courts on what is adequate may differ from those of politicians who ultimately decide on those budgets. This is also true for national courts. However, this difference may be even greater at the, at the international level. Here, states with different legal systems, traditions and level of prosperity, as well as diverging views on the necessary degree of courts autonomy, must find common ground and agree on the finances of their international courts and tribunals. And this is not always easy, as was illustrated in 2007-2008, when the ICJ and the UN General Assembly clashed about the remuneration of the judges and the principle of equality of all the judges. And in June 2021, June of this year, a few months ago, when the Special Tribunal for Lebanon had to cancel the commencement of the trial in the Ayash case, after the registrar had indicated that the tribunal no longer had the necessary funds to perform its mandate. The adjugovins that adopt the budgets of international courts and tribunals are often the same as the ones that elect their judges, organs composed of representatives of governments. <clears throat> 
However, while judges are sometimes elected in other ways as well, this is hardly the case with the adoption of the budget. The budgets of almost all international courts and tribunals are adopted by plenary policy making organs. Exceptionally, the budget of the EU court is established by the European Parliament and the Council, and it is for the President of the European Parliament to declare that the budget has been definitely, definitively adopted. Only in two other cases, those of the ECOWAS court and the East African Community Court, do parliamentary organs play a role in the decision-making process about the budgets of these courts. This exceptional role of international parliaments may be explained by the supranational nature of these regional organizations, in which decisions are increasingly taken outside the full control of national parliaments. The resulting democratic deficit is repaired by giving budgetary powers to parliamentary organs of the organization. A third function of governance institutions of international courts and tribunals is the enforcement of judgments. Themis, the goddess of justice in Greek uh, myth, 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 mythology, is usually depicted with both a skill and a sword. This is true for national courts, but even more so at the international level. The international legal order traditionally lacks enforcement mechanisms similar to those existing at the national level. Only in a limited number of cases are states willing to submit themselves to the jurisdiction of international courts and tribunals and to their binding judgments. The willingness to also accept the enforcement of such judgments is even more limited. Almost all the rules governing international courts and tribunals explicitly state that judgments are binding and must be complied with. However, what should happen in cases of non-compliance? What if one of the disputing parties claims that the judgment is not implemented by the other party or the other parties? The answers to this question vary. For instance, in the case of the Court of the Eurasian Economic Union, enforcement is explicitly left to the disputing parties. In other cases, a variety of soft or more stringent instruments and measures exist to improve compliance with judgments. In several cases, indugovins play a role in this regard, although this is sometimes more evident on paper rather than in practice. A closer look shows, first of all, that in some cases, a party claiming that the judgment is not implemented may resort to the same court again, but now with a new claim, non-compliance with the judgment of the court. In case the court concludes that its judgment is not implemented, this may create additional pressure to the non-complying party. The next question then is whether there are any other instruments to be used in order to ensure compliance. One such instrument can be found in the domestic legal order of the state's parties. Existing national rules, procedures and institutions for the enforcement of judgments of national courts um, may sometimes be used for the enforcement of judgments of international courts and tribunals as well. For example, decisions of the Seabed Disputes Chamber of the, of the uh, International Tribunal for Law of the Sea shall be enforceable in the territories of the state's parties in the same manner as judgments or orders of the highest court of the state party in whose territory the enforcement is sought. Some instruments specifically provide that the execution of decisions involving financial penalties, compensatory damages, etc., is done in accordance with the relevant rules of the relevant state. For example, rules of civil procedure, rules governing the execution of judgments against the state, etc. In all these cases, national rules, procedures, and institutions perform a dual executive function, not only one within national legal systems, but also another one within the international legal order. There is something paradoxical in this. National rules, procedures and institutions, including courts, are both friends and foes of international courts and tribunals when it comes to the enforcement of their judgments. On the one hand, they are an ideal ally. Positioned within national legal systems, they may provide the international themis with a much needed sword. On the other hand, positioned with the national legal systems, they may also be reluctant to use this sword, having a first and main executive function at the domestic level. 
and a natural loyalty towards the relevant national authorities. How this paradox plays out in practice depends on many variables, such as the independent position of the national courts within their own domestic legal order, the specific international court and case at hand, and more generally, a more open or more closed tradition towards the international legal order. There is a lack of research in this field. The execution of judgments of international criminal courts and tribunals is supervised by these courts and tribunals themselves. For example, in the case of the ICC, the enforcement of a sentence of imprisonment shall be subject to supervision by the court, as is provided by the statute of the ICC. Finally, in a number of cases, policymaking organs, often the supreme organ of the organization of which the relevant court forms part, play a certain role in the enforcement of judgments and decisions. Sometimes it is for one of the states concerned to raise an issue of non-compliance before this organ. For example, the UN Security Council in case of the ICJ, Article 94 of the UN Charter. In other cases, it is standard procedure for the policymaking organ concerned to supervise the execution of court judgments. Examples are the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe and the WTO Dispute Settlement Body. Sometimes it is at the full discretion of the policymaking organ to decide what measures are taken in cases of non-compliance. Alternatively, specific sanctions are mentioned. With respect to the WTO appellate body, the WTO dispute settlement body may adopt sanctions. For example, it may authorize suspension of the application to the member state concerned of concessions or other obligations under the covered agreements. The European Union has the most advanced system for the enforcement of judgments of the EU court. It is for the European Commission, so not for an organ composed of representatives of governments, to supervise the implementation of judgments. In addition, the court may impose a lump sum or penalty payment on the state concerned at the end of the procedure. It may be concluded that judgments of international courts and tribunals are often enforced in a decentralized way by using rules, mechanisms and institutions for the enforcement of judgments of national courts. At the international level, injugovins only play a limited role in the enforcement of judgments of their courts and tribunals. Some conclusions may be drawn from this overview of the governance institutions that perform the three key governance functions mentioned. First, the governance of international courts and tribunals is mostly partial, not integral. For each court or tribunal, the three governance functions distinguished are in most cases not carried out by one and the same body. One single in Jugovin for a court or tribunal is the exception rather than the rule. Examples of such exceptions are the ICC Assembly of State Parties and the Supreme Council of the Eurasian Economic Union. It is difficult to assess whether this has any implications. Is it better to unite all governance functions for a particular international court or tribunal within one institution so that it can have an overall view? Or is it better, for example, to have budget decisions adopted by governmental organs while the procedure for electing judges includes uh, elements um, that are outside uh, the control of governments. Answers to questions such as these may be different in different parts of the world and may also depend on whether one takes the perspective of a court or that of a government. Second, it is rare for an international court or tribunal to have one dedicated in Jugovin. The example of the ICC Assembly of State Parties is exceptional. The exclusive raison d'etre of the Assembly of State Parties is the ICC. For another universal court, the ICJ, this is completely different. The agendas of the General Assembly and the Security Council of the UN are filled with many topics. The ICJ occupies only a small part of their activities. Again, it is difficult to assess whether this has any implications. When ICJ, former ICJ President Rosalind Higgins addressed the Security Council in 2006, she stated, and I quote her, the Security Council, faced with the massive problems in its agenda, might be forgiven for wondering whether judgments by a court with no enforcement powers of its own, indeed, the Charter provides that the enforcement of court judgment lies ultimately with the Security Council, will in fact be complied with, end of quote. <clears throat> 
do states consider the Security Council as a body that should focus on questions of war and peace rather than on compliance with judgments of the World Court? Third, there may be different factors that influence or determine the governance arrangements for an international court or tribunal. Jurisdiction plays a role, as is clear when we see that international criminal tribunals and the ICC themselves supervise the execution of judgments. Some European courts have supranational governance characteristics, while governance of Eastern European courts is largely intergovernmental. The government, government governance characteristics of, Eastern, of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court can partly be explained by the late colonial time of its creation. In many cases, international courts and tribunals are part of a larger international organization, making it obvious that governance functions are carried out by other policymaking organs of the same organization. Fourth, what has been mentioned above in the context of the election of judges is also true more generally. The governance of international courts and tribunals is not the exclusive domain of bodies composed of representatives of governments. While this is largely true for the adoption of budgets, not only the election of judges, but also the enforcement of judgments are partly carried out in other ways. Fifth, it seems that the third governance function that I discussed, the enforcement of judgments, is rather underdeveloped compared to the election of judges and the adoption of the budget. This is perhaps unsurprising as the enforcement of international law generally and the enforcement of judgments of international courts and tribunals in particular is an area in which states are reluctant to relinquish control. However, even in this area, the demands of compliance may prevail over holding on to sovereign control, as is demonstrated by the possibility in the European Union to impose lump sums and penalty payments on non-complying states. Following this overview, I will now, in the third part of my presentation, propose a typology of the existing governance institutions. The states participating in the creation of an international court or tribunal organize their judicial governance cooperation in different ways. The existing external governance structures for international courts and tribunals follow one of the three following models. First model. The Indjugovin is an organ of an international organization. It is embedded within the larger international organization of which its court or tribunal is also part. This is the case for the large majority of Indjugovins. Examples are the General Assembly of the Security Council of the UN, the WTO Dispute Settlement Body, the Committee of Ministers, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, and the governance institutions of a number of courts of other regional organizations. This is to some extent the prototype of an Indjugovin. The other two models came later and are less common. Second model, the Indjugovin is a treaty organ. As such, it is self-standing and not part of an international organization, normally lacking its own international legal personality. This type of Indjugovin is rare. The two only examples are the Assembly of States Parties of the ICC and the Meeting of States Parties to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, also called SPLOS. Third model. In other cases, the cooperation between the states concerned is organized within a loose gathering of relevant states, not created as an organ of an international organization or a treaty organ. For example, the judges of some international courts and tribunals are appointed by the states parties to the constituent instruments establishing these courts and tribunals. The judges of the Court of Justice of the European Union are appointed by common accord of the governments of the member states. And the judges of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights shall be elected by the states parties to the convention at the OAS General Assembly. This third model, meetings of the states parties, is also used for the UN human rights treaty bodies. Now, these three models show that international judicial governance is structured in di diverging ways, covering the whole gamut of institutionalized international cooperation, from almost pure ad hoc meetings, having hardly any pre-established rules 
to fully fledged international organs that are almost always organs of an international organization. International courts and tribunals sometimes have one single in Jukovin belonging to one of the three models that I mentioned, for example, the Assembly of State Parties. In other cases, they have two or more in Jukovins, either belonging to one model or two more. For example, while the Indjukovins of the Court of Justice of the European Union, the Council, the European Parliament and the Commission belong to the first model that I mentioned, the judges of this court are not appointed by one of the institutions of the Union, but by common accord of the governments of the member states, which is the third model that I distinguished. These three models by which states establishing an international court of tribunal organize their judicial governance cooperation raise the question to what extent and how international judicial governance institutions are more than the sum of their members. This is hardly, if at all, the case in the third model that I distinguished, a loose gathering of the relevant states, since this gathering lacks an organic nature. This is different for the other two models, organs of international organizations and treaty organs. By definition, these are living organisms having an existence and a practice of their own, having the capacity to develop the necessary esprit de corps. They are created by treaties which may lay down legal boundaries which restrict the sovereign discretion of the participating states and within which these institutions must operate. Such legal boundaries are mostly of a procedural nature. The decision-making and other procedural rules of the governance institution concerned must be respected. For example, member states of the UN are not free to nominate candidate judges of the ICJ in any way they want. The ICJ statute has detailed rules on the nomination of such candidates. For reasons related to the independence of judges, nominations are made not by governments of the member states, but by national groups of the permanent court of arbitration. Elections are by the General Assembly and the Security Council. UN member states are not free to elect members of the ICJ in any way they want. They must do so in their capacity as members of the General Assembly and the Security Council and by following specific procedural rules laid down in the ICJ statute. For these reasons, Indjugovins are more than the sums of their members if they are organs of an international organization or treaty organs. Does this matter? It will never be possible to demonstrate convincingly that such Indjugovins elect better judges and adopt more adequate budgets for their international courts or tribunals than ad hoc gatherings of representatives of state parties. There is no alternative history that would allow a comparison. However, there are good reasons for arguing that it is preferable not to take governance decisions that are so vital for the successful functioning of international courts and tribunals in an ad hoc improvised or haphazard way, but to follow rather a more organized model based on predetermined rules following past practice where applicable. In short, more in accordance with the rule of law. If this is done, if the relevant decision-making is not only power-based, but rule-based as well, there is also room for decision-making to be guided by two key governance principles, independence and accountability. And it is in the fourth and final part of my presentation that I will now to turn to these two key governance principles. The three above match, uh, the three mentioned uh, key functions for the governance of international courts and tribunals can only be performed properly if, if these two principles of independence and accountability are respected. They are well established at the national level, I presume also in India. The requirement that courts and their judges are independent is generally recognized. The requirement that courts are accountable is generally recognized as well, even though it is more abstract and not well covered in international legal instruments. While the principles of independence and accountability are also important for national courts and tribunals, they are even more important in the international society, where sovereign and sometimes very powerful states rule and where courts are not embedded in a strong legal order. International courts and tribunals cannot perform their functions if they are not fully independent and if they are not also fully perceived as such. <clears throat> 
Neither can they perform their functions if they are not or not sufficiently accountable. First of all, to the states that have established them, but also to the wider public. The principle of independence is usually explicitly mentioned in the statutes and other legal instruments of international courts and tribunals. Distinction should be made between the independence of the international courts and tribunals as organs and the independence of their judges. Usually the statutes and other legal instruments contain a variety of provisions to ensure this independence. Examples are provisions on the privileges and immunities of the court and the judges, the inviolability of the premises of the court, the qualifications of the judges, the prohibition to dismiss judges, unless the other judges conclude that one of them no longer fulfills the required conditions. However, practice demonstrates that these provisions are not always observed. In May 2016, the United States blocked the reappointment of one of the WTO appellate body members, Seung Wa Chang from South Korea. The US was of the opinion that, and I quote the US representative now, that his service did not reflect the role assigned to the appellate body, uh, and that it was concerned about the manner in which Mr. Chang conducted oral hearings and about the appellate body's adju adjudicative approach. End of quote. In a meeting of the dispute settlement body, many members of the WTO criticized the United States and stated that the independence and the impartiality of the appellate body was at stake. Therefore, within the Njugovin concerned, this WTO body, there was the necessary resistance to the United States. Here, the flaw in the system was the rule that decisions must be taken by consensus without the fallback option of voting if no consensus can be achieved. Another example is the arrest and detention of a Turkish national, Judge Akai of the International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals in September 2016 in Turkey. He was convicted in June 2017 on a single charge of being a member of a terrorist organization and was sentenced to 7.5 years of imprisonment. All of this violated the immunity of Judge Akai, and the mechanism was unable to fully perform its functions without him. In spite of all necessary attempts by President Merrill of the mechanism, its in Jukovins, the UN Secretariat, the General Assembly, and the Security Council failed to take action against Turkey. Only in June 2017 was Judge Akai provisionally released. The principle that judges and their international courts and tribunals are independent is generally recognized as a key principle. At the same time, independent does not mean unaccountable. With independence comes responsibility. The principle of independence is closely connected to the principle of accountability. International courts and tribunals need to be accountable about their performance. There must be an external authority, an institution to which they are answerable where they explain their work and how they perform their functions effectively and efficiently. The principle of independence does not shield international courts and tribunals from any outside interference. In this context, it is useful to distinguish between the judicial functions of the courts and the way in which they are organized and managed. The principle of independence applies in particular to the former, the principle of accountability in particular to the latter. Obviously, such a distinction is easier made in theory than applied in practice. Nevertheless, it may still provide some guidance in defining the spheres of responsibilities of international courts and tribunals and their injugovids. One specific instrument by which international courts and tribunals can implement the principle of accountability is the budget, more specifically the draft budget that is prepared by the court or tribunal and for which it needs approval by the relevant injugovin. By carefully explaining the proposed budget to the state's parties, the court or tribunal should demonstrate why it needs the finances that should enable it to implement the mandate that state's parties have defined. However, no matter how well explained and apparently justified, the budget proposal cannot be considered as non-negotiable, as a non-negotiable offer to take it or leave it. 
The principle of independence does not entail blank checks. At the same time, having established an international court or tribunal entails certain obligations, including financial obligations. In each specific case, the court or tribunal and its injugovin need to balance the principles of accountability and independence when adopting the budget. Always a minimum of trust between the two parties is indispensable to bring budget discussions to a satisfactory end. Another accountability instrument for international courts and tribunals is the annual report, <clears throat> in which they can both summarize their judicial activities and explain the effectiveness and efficiency of their internal organization. The rules of only a limited number of international courts and tribunals explicitly lay down an obligation to prefer, prepare an annual report. Examples are ITLOS, the African Court on Human and People Rights, and the Court of the Eurasian Economic Union. However, many of the other international courts and tribunals publish such reports at their own initiatives without any constitutional provision. The EU court publishes an annual report that is divided into two parts, one covering its judicial activity, the other being a management report. The ICJ itself took the initiative to send annual reports to the UN General Assembly in 1968, following the much criticized 1966 judgments in the South West Africa cases. The ICC has done so at its own initiative from the beginning. In practice, the General Assembly and the Assembly of State Parties normally take note of these annual reports, a neutral term recognizing the independence of these courts. There's usually no discussion on substance. In practice, an important function of these annual reports is that they create a reason for the president of the court to be present in the relevant meeting of the Ejugovin. It offers a framework for informal consultations. The rules of international courts and tribunals are often not only silent on an obligation to report, but also more generally on the accountability functions of governance institutions. An exception is Article 112 of the ICC statute, according to which the ASP shall, and I quote, provide management oversight to the presidency, the prosecutor and the registrar regarding the administration of the court, end quote. Referring to this obligation, the ASP has created a study group on governance in 2010 to facilitate, uh, and I quote, a structured dialogue between states parties and the court with a view to strengthening the institutional framework of the Rome statute system and enhancing the efficiency and the effectiveness of the court while fully preserving its judicial independence, end quote. While this study group has made a number of recommendations, it was also reported in 2020 that there is widespread distrust of the Assembly of State Parties within all organs of the court, and that the study group is an instrument of the Assembly of State Parties to micromanage the operation of the court. Now, I have now spoken for a considerable time. It is high time for a few concluding observations. This presentation has been a plea to take the governance of international courts and tribunals more seriously, both in academic research and in practice. Half a century ago, Ines Claude wrote the following, I quote him. One of the major tasks of 20th century statesmanship is to strike a balance between obsessive concern with institutional problems, which makes international organization an end in itself, and exclusive concentration upon substantive issues of current world politics, which neglects the building of an adequate institutional apparatus for international relations." Unquote. Now, 50 years later, it is clear that the building of an adequate institutional apparatus for international relations, these words of Ines Claude, has far from been neglected as far as the judicialization of international relations is concerned. The growth of the number of international courts and tribunals since the 1990s is without precedent. But what has to some extent been neglected is the building of an adequate institutional apparatus for the governance of all these courts and tribunals. When new international courts and tribunals were created, their governance 
was sometimes treated as the Cinderella. Each international court and tribunal is unique, and there is great diversity amongst them. The jurisdiction and the broader role and activities of the Chamber of Appeal of the Central Commission for the Navigation of the Rhine, a little known international court, have little in common with the jurisdiction, role and activities of the ICJ, the Andean Court, and the Court of the Eurasian Economic Union. However, all these unique international courts and tribunals are rather similar as far as their external governance is concerned. They all need good judges and adequate budgets, and they all face the challenge of the enforcement of their judgments. Therefore, they all need well-built governance institutions. There is significant variety in the governance arrangements for international courts and tribunals. Although it is true that the governments of the participating states are omnipresent and almost always play a pivotal role, in several cases, governance functions are performed by institutions outside their control. At an early stage, it has been recognized that there is merit in limiting the exclusive role of governments in the nomination and electing election of judges. At present, there are a number of nomination committees composed of independent experts, and their influence is significant. Exceptionally, judges are even elected by an international parliamentary organ, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. In some cases, international parliamentary organs play an important role in the adoption of the budget of international courts and tribunals. Finally, the role of governments is limited precisely where it could be stronger in the field of the enforcement of judgments. In a number of cases, this is left to the existing rules, mechanisms and institutions available within the domestic legal orders of the state parties. Traditionally, at the international level, only some weak instruments exist. States have long been reluctant to accept inroads into their sovereignty in this field. However, more recently, the example of financial EU sanctions in cases of non-compliance with judgments of the court has shown that there may be justifications for overcoming such reluctance. I have also given a typology of Djokovic. This typology demonstrates that organs of an international organization uh, of which the relevant court or tribunal is also part are the prototype in Djokovic. Another type of Djokovic's treaty organs exist only in two important cases, the ICC Assembly of State Parties and SPLOS in the case of the Law of the Sea Tribunal. A third type of Djokovic is the ad hoc gathering of the participating states. It was suggested that this third type is less suitable for performing the necessary governance functions. It is preferable to use a more organized model and to perform these functions um, um, on the basis of predetermined rules and procedures, following past practice where applicable. Organs of international organizations and treaty organs provide better guarantees that the relevant decision making is not only power based, but also rule based. A reference to rule based decision making raises the question what rules are applicable to the exercise of governance functions. These rules are specific for each individual in Djugovic. However, it was argued that decision making on the governance of international courts and tribunals must be guided by two key principles, independence and accountability. It is generally agreed that these principles are not only essential for the governance of national courts and tribunals, but also and even more at the international level. Much law and practice of Djokovic is available for further research. The governance of international courts and tribunals should also be taken more seriously in practice when a new court or tribunal is created. It is telling that while only scant attention was paid to governance questions when the ICC was created, two decades later, a true governance crisis impeded this court's proper functioning and resulted in a 348 page report prepared by a body of nine authoritative experts with no fewer than 384 recommendations. So at the end of this long talk, my conclusion is no well-functioning international courts and tribunals, no international justice without well-built in Djokovic, guided by the principles of independence and accountability. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Well, we must return the thank you and, and uh, offer uh, comments to that of a discussion on a speech which was most riveting and uh, thought-provoking. There are questions in the chat, chat box and I uh, request to know others as well to share their questions.
uh, I'll read out the questions and uh, you can club them together and answer them or, or we can take them one by one uh, okay I'll, I'll club them and, and I'll share them so the first question is uh, how important is this is Harshit Jain he's a student and a member student member of the society uh, he, he asks uh, how important is the position when we aspire access to justice because according to his critical thinking he believes that according to the past and, and history as such when we bargain for position or, or uh, there is a denial of justice of some sorts this leaves denial of peace and sovereign justice so he asks you to elaborate on this with a reference to various institutional courts and international tribunals and parties because he, he assumes he, he feels that you've spoken about this and the free hand which must be given to to international organizations somehow this furthers the Adam Smith model of free hand and uh, the discourse around it the second question which we have is this led this two two part question and the first part is that the judges essentially belong to the global north and there is discrepancy of the judges appointment and the second question relates to uh, the the organizational uh, uh, politics which takes place in the political arm twisting which takes place in, in not only the the representation to organizations but also funding the organizations I would add to this question what Jan Klavis has wrote, written about international organizations and uh, more specifically about the WHO which is most prevalent in today's day and age. Uh, so so uh, coming back to what is asked, so do you think the, the era of increasing nationalism and other factors around the globe, the United Nations and other organizations are losing their importance? The, the last question which we can perhaps club here is that in previous discussions, this is by Rahul Tawani who asks, uh, in previous discussions we discussed the Caribbean courts and how a trust fund was created to ensure independence. What is your view on something similar for other international courts to ensure a degree of insulation and independence from the fin finer tappings of state sovereignty? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for these questions. Uh, and I can read them indeed in the chat box. Um, let me take, uh, let me try it. Well, uh, I could speak for a very long time to answer these questions, but let me, let me uh, give, uh, let me make a start. First of all, there is a question uh, whether or not, uh, more, in most cases, the judges are from powerful countries and there is a belief that these tribunals don't represent the third world countries. Well, um, I think if you analyze carefully the composition of these international courts and tribunals, the existing international courts and tribunals, you will be surprised to see that uh, these judges come uh, as, as far as universal courts and tribunals are concerned. So I refer, for example, to the International Court of Justice, uh, the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea, the World Trade Organization Appellate Body. You will see that the uh, judges in these three courts of in which India is also participating, that th these judges come from all parts of the world. And the, the judges in these courts certainly do not exclusively come from the global north. Um, this is laid down, of course, in the, in the statutes of these courts and tribunals. It is only fair, but it is only the practice. So uh, if you, and you can find it on their website, the details of, of the composition uh, of these international courts and tribunals, that is, um, that is certainly taken care of. Also, I mean, um, if you look at other um, uh, courts and tribunals that do not have members coming from all participating countries, you will see that um, the diversity of the judges is considerable. So uh, I'm afraid I do not agree with the impression that uh, these uh, universal courts and these uh, regional courts, that they have only uh, judges coming from the most powerful countries. Um, uh, there is one nuance here, perhaps, um, and to that extent, um, I can understand the, the reason behind this question is that for a considerable time, uh, there was a practice that um, 
the 15 judges of the International Court of Justice should include uh, nationals of the five permanent members of the Security Council. But uh, before this audience in India, I do not need to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to mention that in 2017, uh, this tra tradition came to an end when, there was, uh, when the Security Council and the General Assembly had to elect uh, five judges to the International Court of Justice. There were two candidates up for re-election, uh, Judge Bandari from India, uh, Judge Greenwood from the United Kingdom. And after uh, a lot of uh, rounds of voting, uh, in which, first of all, the Security Council preferred to have Judge Greenwood from the United Kingdom, and the General Assembly preferred to have Judge Bandari from India. Um, finally, um, uh, Judge Bandari was elected. And this uh, long-standing practice came to an end. And well, we need to wait and see um, whether this is permanent or not. But this is the only nuance I can make where you can see that the most powerful states in the world have a certain, have a certain uh, somewhat stronger position in an international court or tribunal. Um, so that would be an answer to, um, uh, to that question. And another question was about the, uh, to, to refer to what I very briefly mentioned in the beginning, this tendency of, of nationalism, of population that you now see in a number of countries. Uh, you see it all over the world, uh, in, uh, in Europe, elsewhere. Um, and it's reflected a, a, a very nice uh, image, impression of this or a nice summary of this. Uh, you can have this at the um, minister in the ministerial week of the uh, General Assembly of the United Nations that is now taking place. I believe the representative of India, the high representative of India, uh, last year it was uh, it was Modi who spoke. I'm not sure who will speak this year, but um, you will listen to these 193 speeches uh, in which um, uh, heads of state, prime ministers, foreign ministers um, give, uh, 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 this is indicated that this should take 15 minutes, give an overview of how they look at international relations at uh, present, the role of the United Nations, international cooperation, etc. And in these speeches, you can immediately see whether the country concerned, the government concerned, has a more internationalist uh, orientation in favor of international cooperation, multilateral cooperation, international organizations, or rather a more nationalist approach uh, that we see now, for example, in countries like in Europe, in countries like Hungary, but also in Latin America, countries like Brazil with President Bolsonaro. Um, my impression is that this is um, uh, that you have to look at these tendencies in a, in, 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 in the long run, in a long term, from a long term perspective. Um, we face, uh, we are living in, in, and I don't need to say this in, in your law school, that is very much internationally oriented. We live in an era of, of integration, of uh, interdependence. Uh, we live in, well, as it has been called since the 1960s by Marshall McLuhan, in a global village. Um, that is increasingly integrated. Uh, but these processes of integration are not taking place uh, evenly and um, um, uh, countries and parts of the population may feel excluded and in some cases for good reasons. And this may result uh, when it comes to national elections in, in nationalist and populist tendencies. Um, uh, but also, uh, I think th this this can change. This is not just a one-way direction that we go from a global village to a period in time that we move into more nationalist and populist times. Um, as we can see today, there the swing of the pendulum may go back in certain countries. Um, uh, now we have President Biden in the United States, President Biden, and I'm sure he wanted to come to the General Assembly in person, physically, uh, to show that uh, the United States is back uh, in international cooperation and in international co uh, organizations. Um, and likewise, you can see this also in other countries. In Europe, we see this also where, of course, on the one hand, we had Brexit, the United Kingdom leaving the European Union, um, uh, and where there are also uh, where have been discussions about the UK um, withdrawing from the European Convention on Human Rights. But at the same time, we see counter-tendencies. Uh, President Macron uh, of uh, France, 
um, um, strongly speaking in favor of international cooperation and international organizations. Chancellor Merkel in Germany doing the same. So uh, it's, it's interesting to witness these processes. It's uh, what I would like to uh, say is very important also from an academic perspective is that we should thoroughly try to understand why you have these tendencies of nationalism, populism, etc. This is not, uh, this is something that we should not see as something that is a mistake. It's, there are reasons why there are these tendencies and we need to thoroughly try to understand why this is taking place and whether these processes of integration, globalization um, should, uh, should, should be uh, governed in, in a better way, whether international organizations should try to deal with that in a better way. Um, well, there's much more to say about this, um, but let me, I see here, very nice a question from a former student, uh, from Rahul Tamani. Uh, I very much remember uh, his presence in Leiden, and I very much remember how much he enjoyed being in Leiden, uh, studying here, pre preparing his thesis under my supervision, and also being present with his family in a very emotional session in the Leiden Academy building when I could present the diploma to him. And he's asking, a, a high level question, um, as I would expect, but uh, very relevant in the context of my talk, saying that um, uh, referring to the two Caribbean courts, international courts in the Carib Caribbean. Um, um, and in this case, in one of these courts, you can see that there's a very special way of financing this court. They have established a trust fund to finance this court. And this trust fund was established for one particular reason, to uh, guarantee the independence of this court and its judges. And I think this is indeed a very interesting uh, model that has not yet so far been followed by other international courts and tribunals. Why is this? Um, Partly, perhaps, because it is not so well known, and that is a reason in itself to study the governance of these international courts and tribunals. But also, if it would be known, if it would be part of the discussions when new international courts and tribunals are established, uh, I'm not sure whether um, these other courts and tribunals would be in favor of establishing such a trust fund. Perhaps they would in some cases if there are strong voices in favor of guaranteeing uh, providing extra guarantees for the independence of these courts. Uh, but I could also imagine that um, the participating states uh, prefer to uh, to stay in control in some way, because if they uh, have uh, an important say in the budget of these courts and tribunals, they can still control to a certain way uh, the way in which these courts operate, function, but also the, 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 the efficiency, the effectiveness of, of these courts and tribunals. So uh, um, if, if I look at this carefully, um, I think, so to summarize, I think this is an extremely interesting example example, uh, very good for the independence of such an international court, but I'm not sure whether this, um, this example would, would easily be followed. Um, it should certainly be considered in other courts and tribunals, but I'm not sure that um, time is ripe for uh, creating such extra guarantees for the independence of international courts, or judges, uh, courts and tribunals and their judges. Um, so that these are my answers to uh, to some of the questions. I'm, I see more questions. Uh, let okay. me. I, I can simply one read more. the question. Is that uh, one more? Please, please. There, there, there is okay. one more, which is from Faisal Latif, I think. Yes, I see this. So it's. Um, uh, 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 there is a question regarding the practice of international organization when exercising judicial functions, such as the ICAO organization under Article 84. How can international organizations separate the political function of these organizations when deciding on issues under the mandate of these special agencies? Examples, the airspace restriction by the Gulf state against Qatar. Yes, this is a very good example. Um, it's fascinating, of course, the... Um, um, the role of politics, the role of law, uh, perhaps, uh, and I see the examples uh, of the ICAO case uh, that you mentioned, but perhaps it's uh, obviously <clears throat> law and politics are interrelated here. Perhaps in this context, 
um, uh, how uh, I could refer to the advisory opinions of the International Court of Justice. Um, the International Court of Justice has provided quite a number of advisory opinions. And I think in all these cases, there was a, a very difficult, uh, sensitive, delicate political uh, dispute uh, at in most cases, the General Assembly of the United Nations. No matter whether we look at the reparation for injuries, advisory opinion, uh, even earlier, the first one on admissions, uh, the admissions case, or if we discuss certainly the certain expenses advisory opinion, um, the ball advisory opinion, and uh, I think in all these cases of advisory opinions, there is a, a very difficult, very delicate political dispute at the General Assembly. However, it's difficult to solve this dispute. And at a certain point in time, it's realized that there also there is a legal dimension to this dispute. And then the participating states discussing how to solve this dispute finally decide uh, in these cases in which a request is made to the International Court of Justice to put this legal question to the International Court of Justice. Uh, it's very interesting to see that in all these cases, usually a preliminary question is raised, is this really a legal question? Is it not a political question? But then almost always the court is, first of all, recognizing that there is a mixture of legal and political elements that surely the court is not in the position to answer to deal with the political question, but that the court is able, has the task, of course, to deal with the legal question. And that is specifically what the court will address. So. Um, as far as this question about the separation of politics and law is concerned, I think there is um, a lot of practice now um, out there in various international organizations and international courts and tribunals uh, in which it is recognized that uh, you cannot fully separate politics and law. They are related, uh, as we see in all these cases in which advisory opinions were requested. However, um, requesting an advisory opinion and the delivery of an advisory opinion by the International Court of Justice, to use this example again, may be very helpful in solving the larger political dispute that there is. Um, at the same time, of course, we also hope that, and that is what you very, very often see, that always these advisory opinions, they contain uh, obiter dicta, some observations of a more general nature, that help the international community to further develop international law. So that is what I would like to answer to this question by Faisal Atik. And then I see um, a question by Harshit Yain. Shall I deal with that question as well? Uh, yes, but I think you've, you've already addressed this. Okay, okay, I did, yes, okay, okay. Uh, yes, okay, so then I have, tried at least to um, to answer to some extent the questions that uh, that uh, have been asked yes yes and and we're grateful to you for for not only answering questions but also giving us a lot of food for thought uh, we're truly truly grateful and uh, thankful to you for for accepting our invite and for speaking for the society it's been a riveting experience hearing from you and your expert thoughts uh, uh, I hand the floor back to you once again for your thank you note, and then we can close. Okay. Well, I would like to really thank you for this excellent initiative for organizing these lectures. Um, uh, as we also, we all of us have learned during the current pandemic, um, there are also blessings in disguise. Uh, I mean, it's a terrible pandemic. We need to overcome this. Um, close to 5 million people have died. Uh, the situation, we saw images of the situation in India at times. So hopefully um, we will now soon uh, get in better circumstances. But one of the things we certainly all have learned during the pandemic, including myself, is to improve communication, to use technology. Uh, I mean, when I started as a teacher, I, there were no computers um, and we could never have done this. So uh, it's a blessing in disguise that we could use the pandemic to improve our technical skills, to, 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 to give these video lectures. Um, that is also what international organizations have learned and have improved. So uh, even during such a a terrible pandemic you see that there are certain advantages and benefiting from these advantages 
is it has been a privilege and a pleasure for me to uh, to receive the invitation to speak for your important uh, law school and your society and um, I, uh, I wish you good luck and uh, a lot of success in, in these initiatives and I wish your students uh, a bright future in international law. Thank you very much. I, I joined Professor Sudarshan in thanking you and uh, we are, we're so honored to host you and we'll, we'll extend the invitation to invite you to our campus next time around and not do this online but rather in person. Thank you so much. Sir. We're so grateful to you. Thank you and thank you to everyone else as well. Thank you.